Okay, in this video, I'd like to show you a proof of the formula for superposition of waves. And this is pitched at somebody who's doing perhaps a university course in optics, or perhaps is uh, beginning a course in quantum physics, or something along those lines. Anyway, so often in physics, we, we denote waves by the capital letter psi. And it's fair to say that, we'll say, when you're adding lots of waves together, the resultant wave is the sum of its component waves, so c sub i times psi sub i. So you're adding all the amplitudes and all the waves together. So the first thing we need to do is to, we'll say, donate what a wave is, so our, ne our electric field is. So I'm going to say the electric field, the first electric field, or the first wave, is equal to its initial amplitude, which is E0, 1, times a cosine of kx minus omega t, plus epsilon. And now I'm going to explain the terms. So E01 is the initial amplitude of the electric field. So I'm going to say amplitude. Next we have a cosine. Because we know we know waves essentially move as sinusoids, so we can describe this by either a cosine or a sine. I'm going to use a cosine in this, in this case. This quantity k here is the wave number. And the wave number k is equal to 2 pi over lambda. And you might say, well, where did this, k, this wave number come from? When people started studying waves, and in particular sound waves, they found that this property, or this component, two, or not sound waves, excuse me, light waves, electromagnetic waves, this factor 2 pi over lambda kept popping up. And they, well, they called it the variable k, and they found later that it basically meant more, or had a physical significance, because it, is, it gives you the direction of propagation of the wave. This component x is also a vector, which I'm not drawing them as vectors, but this one is the displacement or the position of your, your electromagnetic wave. This is your angular frequency, our time, and finally we have this component here, epsilon. Sometimes it's, it's written as phi. And this is your phase shift. Alright, now I'm assuming at this stage that you're pretty familiar with phase shifts, but look, just, just to go over it very straight, very quickly. If you have a unit circle, on your unit circle you have two pi radians. You're going to have zero, you're going to have pi over two, you're going to have pi, three pi over two, and you're going to have two pi. And that's essentially, you know, is, is 360 degrees. Now imagine if I was to shine light, if I, if I would say, first of all, put a handle on my unit circle, and I shone light directly down onto it. And behind that then I had a moving piece of paper. All right. So every time, so so basically, on my piece of paper, I would have a shadow where my dot is. All right. If that makes any sense. And if I, if the paper is moving, and I start turning my unit circle, I will start making a wave. It, I'll make something that looks like this on my piece of paper. All right. So that's showing you how we'll say two pi radians in a circle can be translated into angles on a wave. And the point here is that a sinusoid has, uh, a sinusoid will say, will look something like this, okay, there is one period on a sinusoid. And this phase shift here will tell you what part of the sinusoid you're on. So if you're not starting at zero radians, you might be here. And of course, as a result of that, the amplitude of your field will be different. So the point here is this phase shift allows you to basically move along your period to find out where your amplitude, what your current amplitude is. So your maximum amplitude will be when the cosine is equal to the 0, because that will give you 1. So the maximum amplitude will be equal to E0, 1. And everything else will be reduced. For every other value of cosine, you will be reducing E1, you'll be reducing E1 because you'll be multiplying E0, 1 by a value which is less than 1. And that's your phase shift. So let's just do a small bit more. First of all, I'm going to define that, let's say E01 is equal to, again, E0, sorry, E1 is equal to E01 times a cosine of, initially I had Kx minus omega t plus epsilon. And just for convenience, I'm going to define a new term or a new variable. I'm going to call it alpha. And I'm going to say that alpha 1, in this case, is going to be equal to Kx plus epsilon. So as a result, I'm going to have alpha 1 plus or minus omega t. Similarly, uh, well, similarly, E2 would be the same, swapping the, the subscripts. All right? 
Now, for convenience, I'm going to convert this cosine into complex exponential. If you want to know how to do that, I have a video put up on converting cosines to complex exponentials. Uh, essentially, it is use Euler's formula, so you see e to the i theta um, plus e to the negative i theta over 2. You essentially use uh, Euler's formula, and it will find that that's going to be equal to cosine. Something I'm not going to get into now. Well, that's, yeah, that's cosine. Anyway, so let's just convert this here. We're going to get that E1 is equal to E01 times the complex exponential of alpha 1 plus or minus omega times t, and E2 is equal to E02 times the complex exponential of alpha 2 plus or minus omega times t. The next thing is, we got to remember at the start we said that the, the superposed wave is equal to the sum of its component waves. Ci, okay, something like that. So that means that E total is equal to E1 plus E2, like that. Alright, and that's pretty straightforward stuff. The next thing we need to do is define our irradiance. Okay, so irradiance is the power, and I think you write it as I R R A D I A N C. I think that's it. That's the power. And the irradiance is equal to the electric field squared, or the magnitude of the electric field squared. But look, look at our electric field. Our electric field is a complex quantity. So in order to get the square of a complex quantity, you need to multiply it by its complex conjugate. So how to multiply the complex conjugate, or excuse me, how to get the complex conjugate, is you change all the complex, the signs of all the complex numbers. So in this case, E1 star, star means complex conjugate, is going to be equal to E01 times E to the negative alpha 1 plus or minus omega t. Actually, it's negative iota. And this is going to be E2 is equal to E02 times the complex, the negative complex exponential of alpha 2 plus or minus omega times t. So as a result, we can say that we'll say E total is equal to E1 plus E2. Therefore, E total is equal to E01 times E to the I alpha 1 plus or minus omega t plus E02 E to the I alpha 2 plus or minus omega times t. But in order to get the irradiance, we need to get the square of the electric field. So we need to multiply E total by E total star. Alright, and we know what E total star is, just E1 star plus E2 star. Okay, now I'm going to assume that you're well able to do that. And I'm just going to write down the answer. So if you do that, you're going to have the following. If you put out, excuse me, a common factor of the, the we we'll say the i omega t, you can put out that common factor. So you're going to get the following. The irradiance is equal to, I have to write it nice and small. So I have the common factor e to the i omega t, so that's going to be e0, 1, times e to the i alpha, plus e0, 2, times e to the I alpha 2, excuse me, alpha 1, alpha 2. Close my bracket. Multiply that, of course, again by the common factor on the other side, which is plus or minus omega t. And we're going to have e0 1 star, or we'll say e0 1 times e to the negative i alpha plus e0 2 times e to the uh, negative i alpha 2. That's going to be my irradiance. And of course, this is the product of some form. So we can multiply this together. Alright? So, how do we go do this? If I have on the outside, how do I say this now? Um, let's just multiply, we'll say, this and this and see what we get. So if you look quite carefully and you do the cancelling in the end, because you'll find that things will, start, will, will begin to cancel, you'll find the following. You're going to find that you have E01 to be squared, plus E02 to be squared, plus E01, E02, times E to the I, alpha 1 minus alpha 2, plus E to the negative I, alpha 1 minus alpha 2. 
Now of course, initially you probably would have had an alpha 2 minus an alpha 1, but if you plug out, pull out this negative sign, you get alpha, uh, you get negative i times alpha 1 minus alpha, alpha 2. Alright? Excuse me, there was an out there as well. So, of course, by the way, these cancel because you're just, they're, these are just products and they, they just cancel straight out. Okay, so we don't need that. The omegas go away. Or the i omega times t go away. And this now is equal to i. So you need to ask yourself, what, what do you do next? Alright, so what we're going to do next is look at this component here. Now, if you look at Euler's formula, Euler's formula says the following, e to the i theta is equal to cos theta plus i times the sine of theta. Similarly, e to the negative i theta is equal to cos theta minus i sine theta. That's Euler's formula. If you're doing physics, well, at this stage, you should definitely know all about that. And e to the i theta plus e to the negative i theta is equal to 2 times the cos of theta. A moment ago I wrote that this over 2 is equal to cos theta. So this is just manipulating that formula. So what we're going to do now is look at this. We have that. We have e to the i, we'll say theta. So in this, th in this case, theta is alpha 1 minus alpha 2. And we have e to the negative i theta. So in actual fact, this corresponds to 2 times the cosine of alpha 1 minus alpha 2. So what we can say now is that our irradiance, which is equal to the square of the electric field, which is equal to e times e star, is equal to e0, 1 to be squared, plus e0, 2 to be squared, plus their, their product e0, 1, e2, like that, times the cosine of alpha 1 minus alpha 2. Alright? Now I'd like to remind you what we said alpha was. We defined that alpha was equal to kx plus epsilon. That's what we defined alpha to be equal to. Okay? It's just just something we've defined, that's all. I'll tell you something, I'll tell you more about it later on. So the next thing is I'm going to define a new quantity called delta. Okay, so you might be getting a bit lost, but this delta is very important and you'll see it everywhere. So we said that alpha was equal to kx plus uh, plus epsilon. So I'm going to say delta is equal to alpha 1 minus alpha 2. So that means delta is equal to kx1 plus epsilon 1 minus kx2 minus epsilon 2. And delta is actually, the, what it physically means, it's a phase difference. It's a difference in phase. Alright? It's a phase difference. And you'll see in the, in the future, you'll come across, uh, you'll come across an optical path difference. And the two of these are related in that delta is equal to the wave number times the optical path difference. Alright, so try and keep this in your head that delta is equal to the phase difference of your waves. Okay, so I've defined delta is equal to alpha 1 minus alpha 2. So as a result, we can say the following. i change my bar there one moment. We can say that the irradiance is equal to e0, 1 to be squared, plus e0, 2 to be squared, plus their product, e0, 1, e0, 2, times the cosine of delta. Alright? That's very important. Now, is there anything else I want to show you about this? Um, oh yeah, I suppose I do. Let's, let's just look at delta again, okay? So delta is equal to k times, if you want to rearrange it, x1 minus x2 plus epsilon 1 minus epsilon 2. That's what delta is equal to. What happens if there is no phase difference, whereby epsilon 1 is equal to epsilon 2? Well, then this factor here goes, and you find that delta is equal to k times x1 minus x2. Now look at this. I said earlier on that delta is equal to k times the optical path difference, and this here is your optical path difference. All right? So we can say that um, we can say that it's just yeah. So that that's all I've really got to say about that. Okay, that's just another thing to notice. And finally, the last thing I'll say. This is I'm not going to go into this. 
If your waves are in arbitrary, A-R-B-I-T, arbitrary phase, then the irradiance will be equal to twice E0 squared, and where they are in coherence, when they're coherent, the irradiance is equal to N squared, epsilon 0 to be squared. Alright, so you can see the arbitrary phase, phase excuse me, will give you a limited uh, a, li a limited amount of irradiance, whereas the power given by coherent light is, is proportional to n squared, which is obviously massive. Okay, so that's all I've got, all I've got to say about that. Thanks for watching. Please pass it on to your friends and subscribe to my channel.